Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm Christina Foxley, the Director of Events, and I'm very excited to welcome Nick Redding and Samuel Friedman here tonight to discuss the New York Times bestseller, Methland, The Death and Life of an American Small Town. Featured on the cover of the Times Book Review and listed among the year's 100 notable books, Methland won the 2009 Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize, as well as the 20, 2010 Hillman Prize for Book Journalism. The book was picked as the best book of the year by the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, the St. Louis uh, Post-Dispatch, the Chicago Tribune, and the Seattle Times. In January 20, uh, 2010, the British Broadcasting Corporation purchased global movie rights to the book. Nick Redding, journalist and native Midwesterner, spent four years living off and on reporting in the small town of Oline, yeah. right. Iowa. He has worked as a magazine editor, a graduate school professor, and a freelance writer. Samuel G. Friedman is an, an award-winning author, columnist, and professor. A columnist for the New York Times and a professor at Columbia University, he is the author of six acclaimed books, most recently Who She Was, My Search for My Mother's Life, and Letters to a Young Journalist. Following their discussion, Nick and Sam would be happy to take your questions. We'll be walking around with this microphone, so please wait for that before you speak. They will then sign copies of their books for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming the award-winning authors, Samuel G. Friedman and Nick Redding to The Strand. Uh, thanks very much, and welcome, everybody, to this uh, consecrated ground of literary life in New York, uh, which is The Strand Bookstore. Um, Christina asked me earlier, had I been here, and I promised to withhold the footnote on that till now, and I'll just say uh, about 20... Six years ago, one of my great journalistic mentors, Arthur Gelb at the New York Times, asked me to write a magazine article about intellectual life in New York and left it totally up to me how to define it or where to center it. And one of the places I wrote about back then was The Strand and how Tom Verlaine and Patti Smith, among many others, had been booksellers here. So it's wonderful to be here. And also before going further, I should... Uh, uh, introduce you to one of the great publishers in New York, George Gibson, who's in the back, who's been a wonderful publisher at Walker and Bloomsbury and has brought a lot of great writers, including Nick Redding, out into the literary world. So we're glad to have George with us. And our format will be for Nick and I to converse for the first half hour or so and then open it up to your questions. And um, Nick, I guess I'll start it this way. I may be relatively rare in this room for having passed through Elwine. Um, I went to college in Madison. I had a newspaper job in Minneapolis. My sister went to college in Iowa City at the university. And so I can visualize this town. Um, for me, it's not flyover country, but maybe drive-through country. But the place that I drove through, and I think about, you know, grain elevators and... Um, you know, the German food in the Amana colonies, which aren't so far away, and, um, you know, pan signs for pancake breakfasts on the firehouse, and all these staples of the Midwest, the supper clubs, the little nine-hole golf courses on the outskirts of town. But you introduce us to a place that's partly that, but partly non that, or anti that, or that gone through some terrible reversal. And for everyone who hasn't driven through and who hasn't read the book yet, and I hope you all will, this is, I have to tell you, as someone who teaches nonfiction, an extraordinary book, really a remarkable piece of writing and reporting, but also moral witness. But for those who haven't, what was the L wine that you found there? Um, I, you know, I think the... Um I think the old wine that I expected to find, despite going there uh, with the idea I was going to write a book about the meth epidemic, is kind of the one that you're talking about. I mean, I I, I grew up um, in the area, roughly speaking, and um, it was, uh, I think it was shocking to me to, I mean, there's all the same things that you're talking about. There's still the grain elevators and the, um, and the supper clubs and the nine-hole golf courses and all that. Um, but a lot of it's in disuse, and um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that the sort of signs of entropy that had um, uh, that had become so apparent 
to someone from there may not have been to someone who was driving through. Um, it's not like everything has fallen down. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think I, I sort of found a place that essentially felt as though it was in the midst of being abandoned. And so everything, uh, things still stood, but people didn't necessarily stand inside of them anymore. Um, and uh, that, was, it, that was even a little bit shocking to me, I have to say. You know, um, among the other people from the AARP contingent in this room, I'm old enough to remember New York during the crack era and what it was like to go through a city that was really being convulsed by a drug epidemic, but also old enough to have lived through fear-mongering about epidemics that weren't as terrible mm -hmm. as forecast. What, can you situate the meth epidemic as you saw it there and reported it on that spectrum? You know, how terrible was it, and was it ginned up for or, you know, exaggerated in the media, or was there something genuinely frightful there? And, and if it was, what made it so frightful? Um, I, I don't think it was something that was uh, hyperbolized. Um, I think that in terms of uh, uh, the spectrum of, of drug epidemics, um, the rural United States had never been included in that spectrum. And I think that was part of what felt um, shocking to people in the media um, and yet managed to sort of miss the point because there was this idea of, um, you know, how can people who live in the middle of the country um, have a drug problem? And, and there was this kind of uh, constant drone note that was struck in the media about isn't it amazing people make a drug in their bathtub for instance but the i think the 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 subtext of that surprise was less um the notion that you know meth is a bad drug then we can't believe these are the people that are doing it because we associate drugs with you know the inner city whatever the inner city is i um and so I think that its place on the spectrum was in that way um, just a little bit of an exercise in missing the point. But how did it change life day to day? I mean, what did meth do to old wine? Um, well, you know, the if you look at it in, in terms of like a 30-year sort of economic and... and um, and, and social and, and cultural decline um, the you know the last forty years in, in in economic history in the middle of the country has been one that is is a little bit of a of, of a set piece i mean first for instance uh, heavy manufacturing went away um, a lot of transportation went away in the form of the railroad and then uh, farms were consolidated so these are sort of three pillars upon which um, life had been built since the colonizing of the area. Um, and so meth sort of came at the end of that. And what was particularly insidious about it is that this was a, a, a it was a criminalized way to make a living that was, that filled a sort of a, a very specific economic need. But it's filled it in a way that was perhaps more insidious than, 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 than other drugs because you could make it right there. It wasn't something that necessarily had to be brought in. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think that's, that's part of the kind of meth puzzle that is specific to this drug. Um, and, um, but, you know, it wasn't that meth caused all the problems in old wine, Iowa. It was that meth was considered by a portion of the populace to be a solution to the other problems. And it's not a good solution, you know. Yeah, you know, in answering that, you remind me of uh, Russell Banks's masterpiece novel, Continental Drift. And he chose that title that, and that image of plate tectonics with the idea that people act out their lives feeling like they're acting autonomously without realizing that the ground is moving beneath them with these huge social or cultural or economic forces that they may be 
only dimly, if at all, aware of. What was that interplay like, as you saw it in Elwine, between, again, these, you know, these metaphorses of society and someone's individual decision to make a batch in their, in their bathtub or buy something at the bar that night? Um, I, I mean, I think that's the, in fact, I'm, well, I'm mad at him for having thought of the metaphor before I used it and mad at you for letting me know that somebody else did. But that's exactly, <laughs> um, you know, there, there, so if there were sort of three, you know, tectonic plates that, uh, converged upon Old Wine, Iowa. Uh, one of them would have been the recent history, economic history that I just sort of described, or in Cliff Notes. Uh, another one would have been the recent history of uh, uh, the, the the deregulated rise of the pharmaceutical industry, um, and the third one would have been the the rise of the modern. Uh, Mexican drug trafficking uh, system, and the three of these together, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I sort of think of the book and, and, and thought of it at the time as um, there are all these big things going on, but what do they do to the life of the mayor or the doctor or the prosecutor or, or the addict, that, which are the people that this, this book follows? How did those big things influence their life at two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon? And um, the way they influence it is in two ways. I mean, um, one of them is is very site specific and and physically specific in terms of um, they continue to degrade uh, the production of revenue in the place. Um, they continue to turn the production of revenue into a criminalized form as opposed to an illegal one. And they also just kind of sort of uh, wear upon people psychologically and morally and to the extent that, you know, a small town is a, is a, sm is a, is a somewhat closed system socially. And when people start doing things that are really nuts, um, it... It makes people question their place in the world and, and, and who they are in a way that can't be mollified or, or marginalized like it can be in an, in an urban environment. And, and so I think th that was sort of part of the workings of this whole, that's what the, the tectonic convergence, that's how it operated, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you touched on this a little bit in the last answer, but this is a book of kind of great empathy which you apply to some individuals who are basically adversarial with each other. I mean, you write very movingly about the DA, um, Nathan Lean, line? Lean, Lean. Yeah. Nathan Lean, who's the DA for uh, Fayette County, mm -hmm. which includes all line. And he has, <clears throat> not surprisingly, a contemptuous view of the meth dealers and the meth addicts. But you also write with a tremendous amount of, dare I say, tenderness about some of the addicts um, and even the dealers, but particularly this one addict, Roland Jarvis, who blows up his house cooking up meth and literally his skin melts in the fire and he becomes, as you say, this kind of, you know, Boo Radley sort of, uh, you know, sort of character in, in the town. Um, and whose life is spent being pursued and um, prosecuted and ultimately jailed by, if not Nathan Lyon, personally, the law enforcement system. So how are you able to keep that sense of compassionate engagement with people?